Hello and welcome to Eplay Machine's Fireside Chats. Not as good as FDR's, but he did something. Now, no delays, no housekeeping or whatever, so let's get right into the news. The first thing is arguably a decently good thing. And even though I'm only taking it from one article, it's it's two articles technically. GOP rep Duncan Hunter says he will leave office January 13th. Now, as you can tell, that's the day the episode comes out, so... To the people who are watching this on the day it happens, hooray, Duncan Hunter is no longer in the house anymore. Republican Representative Duncan Hunter of California will leave office January 13th, more than a month after he pleaded guilty to campaign finance violations. Hunter had previously said he would resign shortly after the holidays, an announcement that came after the congressman pleaded guilty to campaign finance violations. The delay has given Hunter the opportunity to collect his taxpayer-funded paycheck in the meantime. He announced his resi resignation in a, in a letter to House Speaker Nancy Pelosi on Tuesday. Hunter, a former Marine who represents northeastern San Diego area, has served in Congress since 2009 and has faced controversy on multiple occasions during his time in office. Congressman pleaded guilty in early December to federal corruption charges stemming from his misuse of more than 20, 200,000 campaign funds. Hunter pleaded guilty to one count of conspiracy to misuse campaign funds and following a brief hearing told reporters that he had made mistakes. Now, for those of you who have no clue about Duncan Hunter, he is, like I said, he's misused a lot of campaign finance, like campaign money. He's one of the most corrupt people in California's delegation. And that's saying something. Because, we all know the whole... You know the whole stereotype, like, politicians are corrupt people that will use all their bribes to just buy whatever they want? Yeah, well... Duncan was literally that guy. Like, he bought, like, jet skis and stuff. Like, and he, like, literally, he's just... He bought, like, jet skis and stuff. And, and do you want to know what's funny? Like, he's also done, like, really stupid stuff, too. Like, if I remember correctly, Duncan Hunter, I'm checking, I'm verifying, like, Duncan Hunter, like, he went to, like, he posted a video of himself, like, you see how easy it is to get across the border? And he goes to a fence, and then he jumps over, and he's like, see, it's that easy. That's why we need to ban immigration, and blah, blah, blah. It's like, and then people found out, like, dude, you're bullshitting us. That's not, the, that's not, of course that's not the, of course that's not the, like, border, you idiot. It's not a wood fence with a gate. Are you, you think we're stupid? It's like, no, it is the fence. It is the border. They're like, no, actually, it's in this area. And it's like, no, well, technically it's the border because it's, te it's technically the border. Like, and he, he's also known for doing something in the last election. You see, Duncan Hunter, he had an opponent in the last election by the name of Amar Campanajar, who is half Mexican, half Palestinian. Well, Duncan Hunter, being a Trump fanboy, made a... Interesting advertisement talking about his opponent, Amar Kapanajar, in the most nicest way he could. Amar Kapanajar is working to infiltrate Congress. He's used three different names to hide his family's ties to terrorism. His grandfather masterminded the Munich Olympic Massacre. His father said they deserve to die. A Palestinian Mexican millennial Democrat named Amar Kapanajar doesn't get his support from the people of San Diego. He is being supported by CARE and the Muslim Brotherhood. This is a well-orchestrated plan. Amar Kapanajar, a risk we can't ignore. I'm Duncan Hunter, and I approve this message. Mmm, doesn't exactly scream, you know, accepting, you would say. Like, this guy is literally accusing a Palestinian Mexican that they are infiltrating the country and are, like, trying to take over the Congress and blah, blah, blah. It's like, seriously, how can this guy, like... 
like, dude, you give Steve King, like, you look at, like, Steve King looks at you and is like, geez, dude, you might have to pull back a bit. <laughs> like, seriously. You, you, you cannot be serious. But he's completely serious. Now, I mean, I know there might be a conservative in the comment section that might be like, but his family is actually participating in being massacre. Yes, uh, I did. I did see that there was a story where Mark Hamadjar did mention. Yes, it is true to an extent. Like his grandfather did participate in the Munich massacre, but his grandfather also died 14 years before Amar Kampanajad was born. So, what are you trying to say? Terrorist blood? You got the, you got the snake oil in your veins. Ugh. Get it out of my face. Now you see me, I'm, uh, I got like, he's got like half jalapeno, half snake blood. I mean, I mean, I got like, like half jalapeno, half, I don't know what, why people have mayonnaise? Like, yeah, yeah, that's that's my blood. It's half mayonnaise, half jalapeno. <laughs> you, 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 whenever, whenever I get a paper cut, I just go to my friends are like, "Hey, you need this on your taco?" <laughs> stupid. This is stupid. Yeah. So, um, I was actually thinking, like, does this mean we get Congressman Kapanajar early? Because Kapanajar is, of course, banging it in a rematch. Because his results were actually pretty close. And many people consider Kampanajar like he was close enough to like the Katie Porter or the Katie Hill or those kinds of like deep Republican districts that were able to flip. He could have potentially done that. But, you know, ads like that were kind of like mm, a little too much. But like, I was thinking like, does this mean we get a special election and Kampanajar gets to be congressman early? No, Gavin Newsom says like, the race is literally just too close to the actual election to call for a special election. So he's like, I'm just going to leave this seat vacant. So yeah, um, if you live in California District 50, go vote for Mark Campanajar. I mean, there's also a Peace and Freedom Party candidate named Jose Cortez, but, you know, Campanajar is better. Don't let the fact that he's endorsed by Obama deter you. He's actually pretty solid. He was a Justice Democrat last election. So yeah, anyways, next story, coming from Texas. Senate candidate apologizes for saying her surname, Titzin Zun, Titzin Zun, is more Mexican than others. Christina Titzin Ramirez used a controversial explanation for her name in her stump speech. Democratic Senate contender Christina Titzin Ramirez, I should stop saying that, Monday apologized for saying that her, that her surname is more Mexican than any Garcia or Lopez. Titinzun is more Mexican than any Garcia or Lopez, the activist told a gathering of Democratic women in Plano. We were the only indigenous group in Mexico that were not defeated by the Aztecs. So you know, I come from a good lineage and I'm ready to defeat John Cornyn. Okay, so this story is interesting for quite a few reasons. One, the right wing was able to use the story a little bit to be like, see, she's a Mexican supremacist. She's saying who's more Mexican than her. Ha, ah, that's weird, right, guys? It's like, yeah, 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 whatever. But the second and possibly third, they're both kind of intertwined, way that this thing was important was something that has been going after Ramirez for a bit. Now, Ramirez... She's half Irish, half Mexican. Well, Latina. Well, I guess Mexican because she said, like, her name is more Mexican than other people. Like, I mean, she says, like, this name is more Mexican than other names. This name is more Mexican than any Garcia or Lopez. You know, there are a couple of other names that many people use as stereotypical Mexican names. You know, Garcia... Lopez Hernandez, as in Sima Hernandez, her opponent. Like, I mean, I can't be the only one who's seen this, right? Like, many people have pointed this, I mean, like, a couple people have pointed this out. But 
she's using this to like undermine Sima's Hispanicness, like to make her seem less Latina than Ramirez. But I mean, uh, no offense, Ramirez, but I mean, let me explain. Here is Sima Hernandez's story. Her family immigrated from Mexico. Like, supposedly both of her parents, I'd assume. Like, she says her family, but like, that would naturally mean, you know, both of her parents, but Ramirez, she's, like, I just told you, she's Irish and Hispanic, well, Latina. She has, all you gotta do is pull up a picture. Sima versus Christina. Who's more Mexican? Sima or Christina? Sima. She's, she's got darker skin, obviously. I mean, it's more noticeable with her. Many people have also said, like, oh, Christina has changed her name a couple of times. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that's verified. But Sima is more noticeably Hispanic. Latina. I don't know which term she's more comfortable with. I've always just liked the term Hispanic. But, you know, some people prefer the term Latino slash Latina or Chicano or whatever. Well, I mean, since both of her parents are Mexican, I assume, yeah, uh, Latina would probably be a better suit. Like, Sima, she has, like it, like, it says right here, like, she's tweeted her story before. In 2018, she was asked if her filing fee for when she ran for Senate in 2018 was drug money. And a political consultant who is Ramirez told her not to run for Senate because Robert was running. So, like, I mean, this is pretty obvious, like, weird, right? Who's more Hispanic? Who's more Mexican? Like, Ramirez is gonna... Like, I mean, it, it's just weird to the point where it's like, you're literally gonna... Me you're literally gonna gatekeep being Mexican? <laughs> you're gonna gatekeep being Mexican? Especially considering... Like... Like, I mean, I'm not being mean or anything, but... Like, I mean, it's like Warren and the... Like, a lot of people pointed this out. It's like Warren and the Native American stuff. Like, it's like, like, she, Ramirez even made a tweet saying, like, I'm going to be, <laughs> I'm going to be, you know, attacked for being too Latina. And it's like, Christina, <laughs> you're, you're white. You're white, bro. You're, well, I mean, sis, you're white. You're, you look white. Like, I mean, yes, you can have a, a good Hispanic heritage, but I mean, if you and me walk across the border, I'm going to get tackled to the ground. And they're going to be like, ma'am, are you okay? This Is this is this illegal immigrant bothering you? And Ramirez, I'm biracial. I'm also half Hispanic, half white. So I know this, bro. I know how you're feeling. But, I mean, I mean, it's just weird. Why, why do you feel the need to, like, gatekeep being Hispanic? It's weird. Now, of course, the thing is, Ramirez, she's, of course, trying to get... She's in the race for a number of reasons. I clearly point out very simply, she's in the race very simply because she doesn't like Sima. Like, I mean, this is kind of obvious. Like, I mean, Sima was the first to announce the run for this race. Now, all of a sudden, this new his Latina... Is like, I must run for Senate under this progressive platform. Like, all of a sudden, she's running for Senate now. Like, I mean, Ramirez, where were you in 20... Where were you last election? Sima was our last election. Where were you? You were working with Robert. And telling Sima, no, 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 don't run. No, 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 we got this. We got this, bro. You don't, you don't need to run. And the thing is, Ramirez, she's got, like, the endorsements of the Working Families Party. And, like... Like, I think Sean King, Sean King, part of his, like, group of, like, we need to flip the Senate. Like, I mean, 
it's a weird thing because he tries to like get progressives, but then Jamie Harrison's there for some reason. It's like the progressives and the semi-progressives and Jamie. <laughs> like, I don't get it. My endorsements are more consistent, to be honest. And I mean, I know it's probably likely that Ramirez will get more votes than Sima. But fuck it, Sima's better. She's the better candidate in the race, ergo, she gets my support. Like, I mean, yeah, I could say, oh, uh, I'll support Ted Terry for the race. But no, Akhenaten was there first. That's his name, right? Akhenaten? She, he was in the race first, and he is running a progressive platform first, and I'm going to stick with him until he either drops out or, like, loses. Or if he does something that I'm legitimately like, I can't support you anymore. I mean, yeah, I'm principled. I don't, I don't leave you when I feel it's convenient. So yeah, next story. This is one that's just kind of bothersome because everyone got like shocked about this when it's not at all shocking. AOC. In any other country, Joe Biden and I would not be in the same party. Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez said in an interview published Monday that Democrats nationwide can cultivate the too-big-of-a-tent assertion that she and her party's 2020 frontrunner, former Vice President Joe Biden, would be in different political parties in any other nation. Asked for a profile by the New York Times, New York Magazine, about what role she might play as a member of Congress should Biden capture the White House, the freshman House Democrat from New York responded with a groan. Oh God, she said, in any other country, Joe Biden and I would not be in the same party, but in America, we are. A spokesperson for the Biden campaign did not immediately return a request to comment. The remarks by Ocasio-Cortez represent a fresh repudiation of Joe Biden, who spent decades of the Senate before serving as vice president. He is widely seen as the standard bearer of the 2020 race for moderate Democrats and has voiced opposition to progressive legislation championed by Ocasio-Cortez and her allies. Now, the thing is, Democrats have been like, oh, How could you? How could you do this? This is just unorthodox. We, we cannot do this. This is bad. They, and, and the thing is, like, it's weird. It, I mean, it's not weird. It's of course, what the Democrats always do. They always, like, point the finger at someone else to take the blame. But the thing is, like, like what Ocasio-Cortez says here, like, very simply, what did she say? Did she say, fuck Joe Biden and he's a stupid loser and I wish that he would die? No. No, she didn't say that at all. She said, and I quote, in any other country... Joe Biden and I would not be in the same party. And you might, and if you're a Democrat in the comments, there is no ifs, ands, or buts. That is a true statement. That is 100% true. That is not at all a false statement. That is not at all a mischaracterization. That is not at all something that is just not true. It is the 100% truth. In the UK, Ocasio-Cortez would be a member of the Labour Party, whereas Joe Biden would be a member of the Liberal Democrats or even the Independent Group for Change, which is disbanded. I mean, AOC might even just go so far as to be part of Green Party of England and Wales. But no, she'd probably be in the Labour. But I mean, to be fair, to be fair, there is a new Labour faction, so maybe you can make the argument, oh, but what about the, in the UK? That's not true. Okay, what about in Canada? Our neighbors to the north. Well, I mean, in Canada, they'd be part of the Liberal Party, correct? Not at all true, no. Because Cortez would 100% be part of the new Democratic Party. Which is ironic, because Joe Biden has considered himself a new Democrat by American standards, but in Canadian standards, the term new Democrat doesn't mean a centrist Democrat, it actually means someone who is further to the left than what we would standardly call a Democrat. You know, they're social democrats, democratic socialists, Jagmeet Singh, Tom Leclair, Jack Layton. Jack Layton is the popular one. But yeah, that would be Ocasio-Cortez's party, whereas Biden would probably be more at home in the liberal party. Like, I mean, in, like, other countries, 
Look at me. Let's just take another look. Neighbor in the South. PRI would be 100% Joe Biden's party. Chris Cortez. Well, I mean, technically she has a complicated party to choose from, but she'd more than likely be in Morena, which is a political party that is spattered purely to be a huge left-wing upset party because the other parties of the past weren't really cutting it. But we'll get to that in my Mexican presidential elections video in 2018. So this is just a true statement. This is not all any ifs, ands, or buts. This is just a true statement. Okay, so... Next news, war powers resolution, and Iran. Turns out the Iranian thing is calmed calmed down for the moment. It's not completely calm, but it's calmed down to the point where nuclear disaster is not imminent. We're kind of like taking a breath, like, <sighs> okay... Yeah, five minutes to cool your your cool your bum bum, and just relax. Well, Congress decided to take this opportunity to, you know, enact the more powers resolution. You know that thing that prevents a president from just waltzing in a war without any provocation. Surprisingly, wink wink. We don't get to have the War Powers Resolution enacted that much anymore. Because it's able to give people an easy out. You know, because a, a president will just go to war and they'll be like, Oh, it's not our fault, it was her fault. So basically, here's how that will break down. 224 yes, 194 nays, and 13 no votes. Well, I mean, non-votes. Like, they didn't vote at all. 220 of the yes were Democrats. The remaining ones were Justin Amash, of course, who's an independent, and three Republicans flipped the party line and voted to enact the War Powers Resolution. Matt Gates, Thomas Massey, and Francis Rooney. Now, these guys, they, apparently like these guys have always tried to enact a War Powers Resolution before, and I think Rooney is one of the few Republicans that doesn't take any corporate PAC money, if I'm not mistaken. But Rooney's also on his way out, so... I mean, and that's kind of probably a reason why he decided to do a good vote once. But I mean, Massey, this is not surprising. What many people have been considering surprising is the fact that eight Democrats crossed the aisle to vote with the Republicans. They are... Andy Brindisi, Joe Cunningham, Josh Gothenmeyer, Kendra Horn, Elaine Luria, Ben McAdams, Stephanie Murray, Murphy, and Max Rose. When I simply tweeted the names out of these people, I got 350 replies, 1.6k retweets, and 1.7k likes. And many of the replies we're like, WTF at representative, why'd you do this? Which shows that people aren't 100% looking into their p candidates as much as you'd think. Because this is literally not surprising at all. Most of these guys, if not all of them, are part of the Blue Dog Caucus, which is a group of conservative Democrats. Openly conservative Democrats. Which shows that literally the party that you identify with, like, Oh, I'm a Democrat, or oh, I'm a Republican, I'm a Libertarian, I'm a Green Party member. Like, like the parties, just fuck party labels. Just call yourself your actual ideology or whatever. Call yourself a progressive, call yourself a moderate or whatever. Just call yourself what you are, not your party, because your party means nothing. So yeah, the War Powers Resistance was enacted in the House, if it if this is one of those votes that dies in the Senate, well, it'll die. But, I mean, hopefully it won't. And hopefully we will not go to a war with Iran. Next story is about the Democratic debates. Now, the next Democratic debate is interesting because only six candidates qualified for the debate. 
I'm going to rattle off their names in order of who is the minority. Minorities will be last, obviously. Joe Biden, Tom Steyer, Amy Klobuchar, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, and Pete Buttigieg. Notice a couple names missing. No Tulsi Gabbard, no Andrew Yang, no Bloomberg, no Booker, no one. Like, those guys, they just, nope, don't get on the debate stage. Now, Bloomberg is interesting. Bloomberg, Booker, and Yang have had the most interesting ways of this thing. You see, Tulsi Gabbard, she almost had a thing, but not quite. You see, she had... 216,759 voter donors which didn't qualify for the donor threshold. Andrew Yang and Cory Booker made the donor threshold but didn't meet the polling threshold. Whereas Mike Bloomberg was vice versa. Which is also interesting because Bloomberg has stated multiple times that since he's a billionaire he will not be taking standard campaign donations And any campaign donations that he can... Like, the way he receives campaign donations is simply buying Bloomberg merchandise. So if you're going to buy Bloomberg merchandise, just know that Bloomberg, that will actually get him on the debate stage if you buy his merchandise, even as a joke. So, don't do that. The thing is, Yang is truly the only disappointment that is actually happening because Yang's campaign really was going good places his campaign was notable it was uh, nobody and he was quickly rising through the ranks and becoming a top contender for the nomination for president I have a feeling that this might be the beginning of the end of the Yang Gang. Now, I don't want to be bleak to any Yang Gangers out there, but it's the truth. It, it might be the beginning of the end. Because the thing about people is they really do not have... Like, they don't... Like, they have, like... I forget what it's called, um... They lack, like, they lack permanence, object permanence, out of sight, out of mind. That's the reason why whenever, when it was like, when they first got Tulsi Gabbard off of the debate stage, they were able to say like, the narrowed field of the final 10. It's like, as soon as Tulsi's out of sight, nobody knows she's running. Like, I mean, if Kamala Harris just magically appeared on the debate stage one day, People were like, oh, she's running. As soon as Yang's off that stage, literally nobody's going to remember him. I mean, he might have, like, some lingering hope. But, I mean, if especially considering Yang is still considered a political nobody, as soon as you give the media a reason not to pay attention to him, they're not going to. They don't pay attention to him as enough as it is. And Yang, his campaign might be in serious trouble, to be honest. This could be both a good thing for the Bernie people, and a bad thing for the Yang people, and bad in general for people who want a fair and transparent election cycle, but we'll just have to wait and see. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe Yang will come back into the debate stage stronger than ever. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention the whole fact that many people are pointing out that this is the whitest debate ever. Fair enough. The fact that on the debate stage, Bernie Sanders and Pete Buttigieg and Elizabeth Warren are considered the minorities, I think that might be trouble. I mean, Jewish, gay, and Native American are decent minorities to be, but, you know, I mean, 
when these guys are your token minorities, they wouldn't be on a PBS special. At least put one of them in a wheelchair. But anyways, now on to 2020 watch. First, we're going to start off with something sad. Marianne Williamson ends 2020 presidential bid. Author Marianne Williamson ended her 2020 Democratic presidential bid on Friday after failing to gain traction in a crowded Democratic field. I stayed in the race to take advantage of every possible opportunity to share our message with caucuses and primaries. Now to begin, however, we will not be able to garner enough votes in this election to elevate our conversation any more than it is now. The primaries might be tightly contested among the top contenders, and I don't want to get in the way of a progressive candidate winning any of them. Williamson pledged to fully support the Democratic nominee. She had laid, like previously, she had laid off all of her campaign staff, and that's it. Marianne Williamson's campaign is no more. Now, what are my thoughts? Well, to be honest, a good majority of people, including myself, paid less attention to her as soon as she was off the debate stage. Like, I mean, back back in the beginning of the election cycle, I remember people were like, get all these candidates on the debate stage. Give enough money to get Bernie, Marianne, Tulsi, Yang, Michael Arth. Get enough money to get all these candidates on the debate stage. But then, all of a sudden, Marianne, her momentum just didn't get there, which is exactly what I was talking about in my last point. As soon as Marianne wasn't on that debate stage anymore, the money dried up. The people didn't, the people stopped supporting her. They didn't give her more money to go into the debate. The money dried up. It's, it was done. So yeah, Yang people here might be in serious trouble. Especially considering Yang is kind of the only relic we had to those simpler times. But we were like, donate money to get all of these anti-establishment candidates on the stage. Like, Yang is the only relic left of that time. Now Yang might be going forever. So, yeah, I do think that Marianne was of the better candidates of the 2020 Democratic field. And I will miss some of her quirky aspects and her actual policy-based aspects, too. But, I mean, overall, you know, Marianne, she probably might be spending her time somewhere else. It's better that she spends her time, like, running in a smaller race that she can actually have a chance of winning. I've been adding her and saying, you know, California District 2033, the one that you ran for before, is up for election. I'm just saying. But anyways, now to give you something a little more happy... Turns out Lincoln Shafee's running for president. He's running as a libertarian. You know, out of all, the, out of the former, out of the, out of the Republican backwash that I expected the Libertarian Party to get, I didn't think Lincoln would actually be the one to take them up on their offer. For those who don't know who Lincoln Shafee is, he's a former senator, a former governor, who has ran for president once as a Democrat and got literally no votes because nobody liked Lincoln Shafee. He was not a good candidate, to be honest. But I was thinking, I'm like, yeah, this might be the only chance he has left to get a actual political anything out of this. This might be his only time to get, like, actual politics done anymore because he... Like, I mean, like, we all know how the Libertarian Party goes. They claim to be principled and, like, super big, like, oh, we're super principled, but then they just end up nominating whoever the Republicans just throw out and go away with. That's happened before. Bob Barr, Gary Johnson. Although many people are expecting Amash to be the one. Hell, a lot of people are even trying to get Rocky De La Fuente to be it. And I'm like, guys, really, De La Fuente... All right, then. But it turns out Lincoln Shafee is going to try to be that guy. And what, let's see let's see what happens. Because Shafee, he might get somewhat. Because 
He did have some decent platform planks in his 2016 run, where he was trying to bring Snowden home and ending the drone strikes. But I mean, we'll, just, we'll see how, how far this goes. Okay, so here's the smaller candidate of the day, Lincoln Chafee. No, I'm just kidding. Napoleon Madrid. He is running to be number one god, number one nation. It's a pretty interesting campaign platform. It is time to change the attitude of America to hold government leaders civilly and criminally responsible for their actions of lack with mandatory prison sentence and higher functional financial penalties and corporal punishment. Hold all government employees accountable for their actions and lack of action, mandatory prison sentence and higher financial penalties and corporal punishment for the government to fight pharmaceutical companies and the lowest price of Americans. Told any company that practices price gouging there will be mandatory prison sentencing and higher financial penalties or corporal punishment. To hold charge cr government representation criminal liable for government waste, waste, and dying medication and healthcare. Removing time restrictions on rape, molestation, stalking, more to come. Mandatory prison sentencing, financial and corporal. Basically, they take a very Christian stance. You do a bad thing you get killed. You know, fair enough. Well, I mean, not fair enough. I mean, to be fair. <laughs> not fair enough to be fair. That's a very valid statement. So, yeah, he's an independent... I mean, I just... I don't even know. I just pull these random... I just go to Politics 1 and click a link and they're just like... I get these insane people. Like, what the hell? I mean, I'm... I'm going to be glad when the 2020 election's over. I'm just going to... I'm not going to do this <laughs> again. This is stupid. So yeah. Now let's move on to the main topic of this video. Again, I was strapped for time. So... The main topic of this video will be... The endorsements that I didn't say. For those who don't know, I made a... Video talking about... Political endorsements... And, you know, I didn't get to all of them. And, well, here I am getting to more of them. This list, again, is never changing. I mean, well, ever changing, not never changing. And I'll just rattle through the ones that I didn't get to. Okay, so the first one is Georgia's special Senate election. Because remember, Georgia has a special Senate seat up for grabs as well. The other one's up for grabs. I'm endorsing Richard Deanne Winfield. He's a philosophy professor and a 2018 Georgia District 10 congressional candidate. His campaign has been known for claiming that it is the first 2018 congressional campaign to run on a federal jobs guarantee, which is notable. I've checked his website platform and... Yeah, he's pretty solid, you know, got the same progressive issues Bernie does, Medicare for all, um, combating climate change, etc, etc. So yeah, that's, that's a big plus. So yeah, Richard for the other Senate seat. Now this one is actually technically not a, a new endorsement, it's actually a replacement endorsement. You see, sadly, Stephen Cox, the Kentucky Senate candidate, has announced that he's not running for Senate anymore because he missed the filing deadline literally by like a couple minutes. So he's thrown his hat to State Representative Charles Booker, Kentucky's youngest black state lawmaker, who is also running a pretty solidly progressive campaign. He, like Steve Cox, is kind of like the Akhenaten Amun and Charles Booker is like the Ted Terry. You know, Booker has a better, bigger profile and was more than likely going to get more votes. But, I mean, I'm already stuck with the big guy, so, yeah, now that he's dropped out, let's see, let's see if Booker can get rid of McConnell. Oh, yeah, and there's another thing. Apparently, there's a progressive running in New Jersey's, um, Senate seat, um... Le Ham is his last name? Try, but I'm again, I'm already with McCormick, so no Ham. 
for the Delaware Senate race, I'm endorsing Jessica Sacrain, a tech industry executive running a Carrie Harris primary challenge against Chris Coons. Her platform calls for Medicare for All, Green New Deal, making minimum wage $15, ending interventionist wars, getting money out of politics, and ending SESTA slash FOSTA. That's a decent plus. Now, I'm pretty sure I went over my special election endorsements in my last video about endorsements, but in case I didn't, I'm just going to say them now. Wisconsin District 7, Lawrence Dale, Maryland District 7, Jill Carter, Cenk Uger in California District 25, and Nate McMurray in New York District 27. Okay, got it? Good. Same platform. This one was the one that I kind of asterisked, and I was like, hey, you know, I'm going to need to do some extra digging because here's what happened. His website was updated, and then it didn't include Medicare for all in his healthcare plan, so I was like, hey, yo, bro, fix this. Be more clear. And he was like, okay, bro, sorry, got you. And that is Chris Rowe for Tennessee District 1. Like, I mean, like I said, he's now got Medicare for All again on his platform. And he's been more clear about his progressive chops. He has a progressive opponent, so it is subject to change, to be honest. But, you know, it's kind of like North Carolina District 11. Turns out that in North Carolina District 11, they have like four progressive guys running. Mo Davis, Michael O'Shea, Steve Woodsmall, and Philip Price. Philip Price endorsed O'Shea, but then decided to run again for no reason. So, in all honesty, in North Carolina District 7, I'm on board with literally all the candidates except for Gina Collis. Because she was a moderate Republican who ran in 2018. So, and I mean... I went to her website to see if, like, if she was going to at least, like, pretend to be, like, for Medicare for All. And she's like, I'm for Pete Buttigieg. I just plan Medicare for All who want it. It's like, no. So, yeah. Anybody but Hollis. Okay, so here's some of the newer ones. In California District 42, we have Liam O'Mara. He was... I originally endorsed Julia Peacock for the seat... But Peacock dropped out. Peacock was a candidate for the seat in 2018. So I was like, she might have the advantage of, like, you know, election. But, eh, she dropped out. So Liam is a more solidly progressive candidate, to be honest. So, yeah, it's not, it's not ma bad. It's just, eh, Julia seemed cool. In New Mexico District 3... I'm endorsing Teresa Leger D. Fernandez. Now, this raises high profile because it is Ben Ray Luan's seat. Ben Ray Luan is running for New Mexico Senate. And this seat is kind of being set up for Valerie Palm. Now, I did not want to endorse Palm because CIA agent. Her platform seemed solid, but I was like, CIA agent and highly edited ad seems weird. So I wanted to see the other candidates to see what they had to offer. And I was attracted to the Kyle Tisdale campaign, but he just didn't seem to have, like, enough. And Teresa did have that enough. So yeah, Teresa has my support. Medicare for all, Green New Deal, strict gun control, free college, immigration reform. You know, the stuff that we expected. Okay, so the next seat is West Virginia District 2, Kathy Cooknell. She's an energy policy expert and public advocate running for the West Virginia We Can't Wait campaign. Look at me, there's a campaign in West Virginia called West Virginia Can't Wait, which was started by gubernatorial candidate Stephen Smith. Who, yeah, I didn't get to... We'll get to that when we get to that. She is, like, she's running on a Medicare for All and stuff. Basically, a populist left, it's basically a populist left contract. You know, like, those contracts, like, you know, the Not Fossil Fuel Pledge. So, West Virginia candidates will sign a pledge, basically saying that they can't wait to get this progressive change done. 
and Kathy's one of the candidates. So yeah, Kathy's pretty solid. In Georgia District 13, we have Michael Owens. He was a candidate for the seat in 2014 and was a Democratic Party chairman. Not the Democratic Party, but like his local Democratic Party. And he's a brand new Congress endorsed candidate against a blue dog Democrat. So yeah, I 100% back Owens in his endeavors to get rid of a blue dog. In Utah District 4, we have Daniel Bergstrand. He and the next candidate were brought to my attention because of the recent War Powers Act vote. You see, Daniel is running against Ben McAdams. So, yeah. I want this guy to replace Ben McAdams 100%. And many people might be mad because like Ben McAdams' seat was a, considered a huge win for... Democrats in the last election, but screw it, I don't care. The next one is New Jersey District 5, Councilwoman Ariti Kreebich. You see, I kind of went quiet there in the last part of the name because, you know, she's a councilwoman running against a Democrat with a, quote, pro-Trump record. You know, she's running a progressive campaign against a blue dog. And I 100% am on board with all of these kinds of campaigns. You know, get rid of the blue dogs. The blue dogs need to go back to the pound. Now the next and final congressional seat race is North Carolina District 2, Monica Johnson Halster. Now, she is a Wake County Public School Board member. Now, you may know... I originally supported Jason Butler, but due to the whole um, redistricting and refiling, turns out Butler will not be running. Now, I've had my eye on Monica for a while because, you know, she doesn't seem to strike me as like a blue dog or anything, but I was like, she's just going to have to give me a platform first and then I'll consider. And yeah, I looked at her platform. Yeah, she's 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 solid. I think she's a decent candidate, one hundred percent, and she has my support for the seat. Now, here's some things that we didn't get to: gubernatorial seats. I'm currently endorsing four gubernatorial candidates, none of whom are mine. So yeah, let's get to the four gubernatorial seats. The first one is an incumbent. 2020 Washington gubernatorial race, we have Jay Inslee. Now, Jay Inslee, you may or may not have some some thoughts about him. I've always considered Jay Inslee part of the better side of the Democratic presidential primary field, but he's definitely not the best. He's probably the best governor we have at the moment. So, yeah, I am I did make a promise that I would endorse and support his gubernatorial run if he went back to his gubernatorial run instead of wasting his time on his presidential run. And, yeah, I decided, yeah, I'll support Jay Inslee. Jay Inslee is a decent governor. Like, I mean, he's done a lot for Washington so far, and it looks like they'll be doing better. I mean... I mean, I know this isn't 100% the best in regards to healthcare or even the best in regards to progressive stuff, but he did get Washington to have a public option, and that is a huge step. Now, I think if he just decided to take a step further, it would do well. Okay, so the next gubernatorial race, we have Stephen Smith. Member, leader of the West Virginia Can't Wait movement. Now, originally I was going to wait for Richard Ojeda to make a run for the seat, but I got bored. Like, I literally got bored for Ojeda to run for this seat, much like the Senate seat. I was waiting to at least see Will Ojeda at least throw his hat in the ring. But I got bored for him waiting, so I decided to endorse him anyways. And even if Ojeda jumps in the race, I highly doubt I'll be reconsidering. 
It's because Steven Smith, he hasn't made the mistakes that Ojeda has because Ojeda has been making some errors. He's been endorsing some of the wrong candidates, in my opinion. I mean, North Carolina District 3, Bew, you endorsed Richard Otter, Bew. Ike Johnson was right there to have your back, man. Okay, yeah. So, he's a pretty solid candidate. Okay. So, in 2020, New Hampshire gubernatorial race, we have... Daryl W. Perry. Of course not Daryl W. Perry. What are you, th are you, you think I'm crazy? You think I'm crazy to have Daryl W. Perry on my endorsement site? Get out of here. Now... I did consider waiting for Steve Marchand to make a move, but I'm like, no, nah, I think I think I'm gonna stick with Andrew Valinsky. He's a he's a delegate for Bernie in 2016. He's endorsing him in this election, and he's running a decently solid progressive platform for New Hampshire. Now, hopefully, we can try and make the New Hampshire we could try to do the Free State Project for progressives. For those who don't know what the Free State Project is, it's where libertarians literally just grab literally everything they can and move to New Hampshire, and they'll overpopulate New Hampshire to the point where it'll be a libertarian haven. And and the thing is, it didn't work. There have been some people who are free projectors, but it hasn't worked. Now, the last gubernatorial endorsement is something I found out literally just today and it'll be like the day that this comes out will be the first day that will be the day he officially announces I think but Vermont gubernatorial race David E. Zuckerman like as soon as I found out David E. Zuckerman was entering the race for the Vermont gubernatorial race I was like Yes, 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 yes. Like, because this guy, he's, he's, like, I mean, let, you all like Bernie, correct? I assume at least a majority of you do. If you like Bernie, you're gonna like David. This is just younger Bernie. Like, literally, to the point where I was like, if Bernie becomes president, and they do a special election for Senate, I wanted this guy to run now it looks like he'll be too busy with the governorship, but maybe he you just use the gubernatorial thing to get him in the Senate, but hopefully not. The one thing that I will, that I both beg and am willing to sacrifice, David E. Zuckerman is the highest elected official with a third party in Vermont. He has a coalition with the Democrats, but he is primarily affiliated with the Vermont Progressive Party. Now, I hope that he keeps himself elected as a Vermont Progressive Party member first, and a Democrat second. But if he just decides to switch, like, I'll be sad, but I'm willing to sacrifice that. If, as long as David Zuckerman gets to be governor, or even senator, whatever. So yeah, those are my endorsements so far. We'll see who comes on the list next. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quora, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report.